colleagues, uh, we have a quorum, and uh, I'm calling uh, the meeting to order. Et je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Committee des Affaires Sociales. I'd like to welcome you to the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology. Nova Scotia, Chair of the Committee, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, starting on my left. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> Art Eggleton, Senator from Toronto and Deputy Chair of the Committee. Diane Griffin, Senator from Prince Edward Island. René Cormier. René Cormier, New Brunswick. Nancy Hartling from New Brunswick. Chantal Petitclerc, Senatrice du Québec. Chantal Petitclerc, Senator from Quebec. New Brunswick. Judith Seidman from Montréal, Quebec. Thank you, colleagues. And I remind us that uh, we are continuing uh, with uh, our uh, welcome to witnesses concerning Bill S-5, an act to amend the Tobacco Act and the Non-Smokers Health Act and consequential amendments elsewhere. It's commonly known as the Tobacco and Vaping Products Act. And we have three uh, sessions today. Uh, in this uh, uh, first panel, I am uh, going to be uh, w welcoming them in the order they appear on my uh, agenda, which fortunately uh, has our distinguished visitor by video conference listed first, because we always go to our uh, witnesses by video conferences first in case of any gremlins in the system at some point. It's critical we get their testimony uh, and uh, their presentation and then hopefully all of their, their questions. So in that regard then, I'm going to in, uh, invite Dr. John Britton who is director of the UK Centre for Tobacco and Alcohol Studies. Uh, Mr. B uh, Dr. Britton, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham, and I'm a consultant in respiratory medicine at Nottingham City Hospital, so I, I deal with the effects of smoking in clinical practice every day. Uh, in addition to the UK Centre, I also chair the Royal College of Physicians Tobacco Advisory Group and through that role have been responsible for the production of two reports on tobacco harm reduction. One in 2007 called Harm Reduction in Nicotine Addiction, which maybe you can see here. And then last year, uh, something called Nicotine Without Smoke, which is, uh, focuses particularly on the role of electronic cigarettes. Uh, we all know that smoking kills people, uh, ends lives prematurely, it causes untold damage to adults, and it harms children, harms the unborn child, and it drives poverty, and it is the major determinant of social inequalities in health. And so treating smoking is a huge public health priority in all developed countries. Um, Conventionally, we've done very well in reducing the prevalence of smoking but in Canada, in the UK and in many other countries through standard approaches to tobacco control, which have been things like advertising bans and the uh, health warnings that Canada championed, um, smoke-free policies and so on. And those have had their effects, there's no question about it. But if you look at the figures on smoking prevalence within age groups in the UK for sure, what is very clear is that those measures have been very effective in preventing children from becoming smokers, but they've been far less effective at helping established smokers to quit. And in fact, if you are a 25-year-old smoker today, the likelihood that you will quit smoking in your lifetime is probably far less than it was as a 25-year-old smoker 30 years ago. We need measures that help those established smokers to quit. And that's partly because it saves lives, but also because that pays off on our health services and our society now and next year and in the next five years, whereas preventing uptake of smoking pays off in 50 years. We have had a whole a sort of sacred cow of smoking cessation, which is that smokers should learn to give up nicotine in order to give up tobacco. And the 2007 report from the RCP that I mentioned really made the argument that that ne necessarily isn't the case, that we could encourage smokers to switch to an alternative source of nicotine and just give up the smoke. The logic being that nicotine is about as hazardous as caffeine, it's the other toxin in cigarette smoke that kill. At the time that report came out, there were very few alternatives for smokers. 
but the proof of principle came from Sweden, where the use of uh, oral tobacco has largely replaced smoking, so that Sweden has one of the lowest prevalence rates of any developed country. And it's as a consequence of smokers shifting onto uh, smokeless tobacco. But we didn't have products that were legal in the UK. Electronic cigarettes came along in around 2007 8 and have since become extremely popular in the UK. Um, our government has taken a very liberal line on marketing and use of electronic cigarettes. And so we're now in a situation where 2.8 million smokers have used electronic cigarettes and about 1.2 million are regular ex-smokers who are using electronic cigarettes. And that has been achieved by arguing strongly the case in favour of a switch to a less harmful product for those smokers who can't quit. We've needed effective regulation to make sure the products deliver nicotine and that they're as safe as is reasonable to expect. But the key thing is to be able to promote those products to smokers. And the reason that I ask to give evidence today on the Canadian bill is simply the clause about making comparisons with the safety of smoking. Because I think it is absolutely vital that health professionals can say to smokers, you are much, uh, we don't know the long-term risk of these products. Uh, it would be much better if you quit all smoking and nicotine use forever. But if you can't do that, then it is a no-brainer to switch to a less hazardous product. And I don't think there can be any question that electronic cigarettes are less hazardous than smoking. If we don't give that message strongly from the health lobby or the health opinion, smokers get confused and start to think that maybe these products are just as hazardous, so why bother to shift? And the default then is to continue smoking. And so that's my main issue, and that's, as I say, why I asked to give evidence today. So I'll stop there, but be very happy to take any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Britton. And uh, I'm now very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Dr. David Hammond, who is Associate Professor at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Hammond, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, I am a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Waterloo. I'm a scientist. I conduct research on tobacco use and e-cigarettes, including how products are designed, how they're marketed, and how they're used by consumers. And I'll just note that I don't accept any industry funding. I don't represent any organization for or against vaping or tobacco products. And I've served as an advisor to agencies around the world, including as an expert witness in tobacco litigation on behalf of the Canadian government and on behalf of the Australian and UK governments in plain packaging legal challenges. Overall, it's my opinion that the measures in Bill S5 have the potential to advance public health in Canada. <clears throat> In particular, the proposal to implement plain packaging would enhance tobacco marketing restrictions. And I've been following the hearings over the past week, and I admit to being somewhat alarmed about some of the misinformation on plain packaging, in particular, the impact of plain packaging in Australia. It is a fact that Australia experienced the largest ever decline in smoking prevalence after plain packaging was implemented. And the most extensive analysis to date determined that after adjusting for tax increases and other measures that were implemented over the same time, plain packaging resulted in more than 100,000 fewer Australian smokers. Now, if plain packaging were to have the same impact in Canada, that would translate to 190,000 fewer smokers. The scientific evidence on pl plain packaging includes close to 100 published scientific studies which are consistent with the Australian data. And if anyone has any doubt about the importance of packaging or brand imagery, I would encourage them to read the hundreds, indeed the thousands, of previously secret industry documents which describe very clearly how tobacco companies research and design brand imagery displayed on packages and its importance in promoting smoking. The evidence is clear. Cigarettes in plain packaging are less appealing to try. They increase perceptions of risk and they enhance the impact of health warnings. That's not only the opinion of the scientific community, it's also been established in legal rulings from the British High Court and the High Court of Australia. And I'd like to address some misinformation presented to this committee about plain packaging and illicit tobacco. 
There are a range of different <coughs> information sources on illicit tobacco in Australia, including data from the Australian Customs and Border Protection Services. These sources do not indicate any increase in illicit tobacco from plain packaging. In fact, there's only one source that suggests that plain packaging has increased illicit tobacco, and that's the tobacco companies. The numbers presented the, to this committee by tobacco companies are from a study paid for by the companies and prepared by KPMG. What you've not been told is that due to the methodology used, KPMG has explicitly warned against using these numbers as an indicator of illicit tobacco in Australia. In fact, a partner at KPMG actually wrote to the UK uh, Minister of Public Health stating that the numbers were being misrepresented to oppose plain packaging. The companies have told you that plain packaging makes it easier to counterfeit packs. You are not told that KPMG examined more than 12,000 used cigarette packages over a three-year period after plain packaging was implemented. And they concluded that, quote, no evidence of counterfeit plain packaging cigarettes. Quite simply, the claim that plain packaging increases illicit tobacco is not accurate. I'd like to briefly discuss the proposals on vaping products. Um, like you heard from Dr. Britton and in other testimony to this committee, I think you've heard an emerging consensus that smokers should have access to vaporized nicotine products. I strongly support this position. Virtually all of the five million Canadians who smoke wish to stop, and vaporized products will help some of them to do so. However, I do have serious concerns about the extensive level of advertising allowed under the bill. While the bill seeks to prevent advertising that would appeal to youth, this distinction will be far more apparent in the act than in real life. It would be naive for us to assume that adult-oriented advertising will not increase the appeal of vaping products among youth, and bans on youth-oriented advertising are very difficult to enforce. There's little doubt that the advertising allowed in the bill would increase the use of vaping products. The question is whether it will increase the types of use that benefit public health. E-cigarettes are used for many reasons. Only one of them results in public health benefit, and that is used by smokers who are trying to quit. In my opinion, smokers do not require lifestyle advertisements to encourage them to switch. Most smokers switch, not because vaping is glamorous, sexy, or fun, but because they are addicted to nicotine and they don't want to die from smoking. The only lifestyle worth promoting through advertising of vaping products is a non-smoking lifestyle. Ironically, this is one of the types of advertising that would not be allowed. Bill S-5 prohibits advertising vaping products in a way that suggests their use would have a health benefit or comparing the health effects of vaping and tobacco products. That's a problem. It's a problem if the goal is to target smokers then that means being able to say that vaping products are harmful, but less harmful than smoking. On the other hand, the bill would permit vaping products to be promoted, to be promoted in ways that are likely to have little or no public health benefit, for fun, because it tastes good, or because it's convenient for times when you can't smoke. Finally, a quick note about flavors. I've struggled to understand the rationale for prohibiting the promotion of child-friendly flavors, but not the flavors themselves. If the premise is that these flavors preferentially target youth, which is indeed the case, then they should be prohibited outright. Smokers do not need cotton candy and peanut butter and jam flavored nicotine to stop smoking. In conclusion, it's my opinion that vaping products should not be promoted at all through lifestyle advertising and advertising should not appear on TV, radio, or other major channels. Restrictions on advertising should be similar to tobacco products, at least for the time being. Now, vaporized products uh, can still be incentivized, over-smoked products through other means, through lower taxation prices, differential health warnings, packaging, etc. And in addition, the bill should allow for tightly regulated claims that, again, vaping products are harmful, but less harmful than smoking. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to my colleagues, and just before I do, I'll remind them that we are exercising the one question per uh, committee member per round, uh, and that uh, because uh, it's especially because we have one of our witnesses by video conference, it's especially important that you identify which witness you wish to answer your question. Even if you want them both to answer, 
identify uh, one first, and I will give the other always an opportunity to uh, to come in. So, uh, finally, uh, Lee, I want to remind you that this session will end no later than 2.30. So, with that, we will begin our questions, starting with Senator Petticlair, uh, followed by Senator Seidman. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Président. Uh Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Be, uh, for you, Dr. Britton, um, there are many things to cover on that bill, but uh, before we get into that, I would, I would like to have your perspective on, um, because you did mention it a little bit, and many have mentioned the short-term effect of, uh, of nicotine uh, in vaping, but uh, I want you to elaborate a little bit on the uh, expected or predicted long-term effect uh, on the e-cigarette. And of course, Mr. Hammond, you'll be free to follow. Thank you. Um, nicotine itself uh, has effects of increasing heart rate, increasing blood pressure, um, uh, constricting blood vessels. And these are effects, as I, as I said in my testimony, which on, a, on the grand scheme of things are on a par with the kinds of things we get from caffeine. So it's not a particularly hazardous drug in its own right. We're better off not using it, but it's not, it's not a drug that on its own will kill you. Um, the other components of vapor, we don't know what the long-term effects, in fact, for, for start, we don't know what the long-term effects of inhaling pure nicotine would be. We don't know what the long-term effects of exposure of the lung to propylene glycol those vapor solutions that have glycerine in them, glycerine also. And then the, the toxins that are produced in the vaping process from the constituents of the fluid, which produce some uh, uh, acrolyne, for example, potentially carcinogenic toxins, produce some particulates, and with flavored solutions, uh, oxidants in the vapor too. Now those things I would expect to cause lung damage in the long term. And this, and this is covered in, the, in last year's RCP report. We would expect the spectrum of damage to include a similar spectrum of lung disease to existing smoking, but at a much, much lower level of risk. So there will, in my opinion, over the next 50 years, be a handful of cases of lung cancer caused by vaping. But that has to be set aside, the likelihood of tens of thousands of cases of lung cancer caused by smoking. So while we have that perspective, electronic cigarettes are not safe, or it's very unlikely that they will be safe. We won't know how safe they are until two or three decades have gone by. But we can predict from the levels of toxin in the vapor that that risk will be very low relative to cigarette smoking. And in the RCP report, we said that it is very unlikely to exceed 5% of the risk of smoking. Could I just comment in, in this response on flavors? Um, I know David Hammond very well, and I respect his opinions on most areas of tobacco control. The experience of flavors in the United Kingdom is that um, many smokers find pure nicotine solutions aversive to use. It find, I find that surprising because they can inhale tobacco smoke, but they find nicotine solutions aversive. And many smokers use flavors which we might consider to be children's flavors to make vaping acceptable to them. And that's why I think in many ways you have it right in that you are saying that you can't advertise a flavor as a child-friendly flavor. But I think taking flavors away from vaping will dramatically reduce the number of smokers who make the switch, and that will be bad for public health. Thank you, Dr. Britton. Dr. Hammond. I would echo everything that Dr. Britton has said about the long-term health effects. Uh, you know, this debate has been one of the more difficult ones for the public health community. And on the face of it, it would appear like there's a lot of contradictory evidence. But really, I think there's been two arguments. One half of folks are saying that e-cigarettes are, are likely to be harmful. And the other half is saying that they're less harmful than smoking. Both of those things are likely to be true. You know, I've read, I don't know, tens of thousands of industry documents. And you can go back to the 1950s when Philip Morris researcher said, even back then, I don't think we can clean smoke very much. We'll try, but if we have to, we're probably going to have to deliver nicotine through something else like vapor. 
you know, we have a tendency to treat e-cigarettes as if they're an alien product. We already have medicinal products that deliver nicotine through different means. If you chew gum, you absorb nicotine in your mouth or upper throat. If you have a patch, you absorb it through your skin. So the mode of delivery is very important in terms of determining the level of risk. And nothing is as dirty as smoke. And so the bind that we're in, as Dr. Britton has said, is that it will be several decades before we can precisely estimate what the risk is. And that's because there's a lag period for a lot of these diseases. But there is ample evidence to state right now that um, Vaporized products will be less harmful than smoked tobacco products, and they are also very likely to produce harm. And that's why I always use the frame harmful but less harmful than smoking. And I think it's taken a few years, but you're starting to see that uh, consensus reflected in public health authorities. Thank you. Senator Seidman to be followed by Senator Eggleton. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your presentations. And I would like to follow uh, along in this uh, line of questioning, if I may. Um, because both of you have made reference to harm reduction and comparison of risks. Um, and Dr. Britton, um, you particularly have talked about um, Sweden as an example of evidence um, where, in fact, a tobacco product was used non-combustible. Um, this piece of legislation, uh, 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 Dr. Britton, you have specifically said uh, precludes this kind of uh, comparison of risks, um, and uh, although e-cigarette products can go through the normal FDA channels, uh, but tobacco, non-combustible tobacco products cannot. So what I'd like to perhaps ask both of you, starting with Dr. Britton, because you very clearly refer to this issue, um, is that clause that you <laughs> refer to in this legislation, how can we fix it if, if it's so important to be able to uh, talk about harm reduction uh, and comparison of risks, what should we do with this piece of legislation to fix that? Well, I, you, I think it's important that health professionals, public health uh, uh, opinion leaders, governments can talk about these products in, in the way that Dr. Hammond has said, of just acknowledging the truth, which is, they are not safe, but they are substantially less harmful than smoking. But without that strong message, smokers reach the conclusion that they're much the same. And therefore, if the government isn't endorsing them, or if my doctor isn't endorsing them, I might as well carry on smoking. So I would just take out the, the prohibition of making any comparison. I think if, if a, this depends on how the FDA laws work for you. In the United Kingdom, electronic cigarette uh, promoters are not allowed to say that this product will help you stop smoking because that's a medicinal claim. And to make that, they would have to go through the British equivalent of approval through the MHRA, Medicines Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority. And it would be nice if some of them did that. However, our MHRA has taken a, what it views as a liberal line on nicotine regulation for products such as electronic cigarettes since 2010, and not one product has achieved a medical license and appearing on the market. So whilst I think we would all prefer that these products met medicine standards to guarantee minimum risk to users, the reality is that medicine's regulation uh, is, is too complex, too slow, and people are dying as a consequence of the lack of products while we wait for medicinal approval. So anyway, so the compromise that we have in the UK is that you can't make a claim that makes it sound like a medicine, but you can say this product is likely to be substantially less harmful than smoking. So make the switch. Thank you. Dr. Hammond. Look, I think that's a very good question. I've been asking myself that over the last few days. Uh, I mean, I'll start by saying that, you know, therapeutic claims uh, in terms of cessation, I mean, we have a, a, a framework for that through the Food and Drug Act. I think that's important, particularly given that it, it allows potentially for greater advertising and companies should be incentivized to go through that product if they believe that they have a therapeutic one. So I think th that remains important. Um, I don't, you know, I, what I would suggest or prefer is a tightly regulated claim. I'm very conscious of um, letting the industry 
dictate the communication on health and relative risks, and I think that there are some concerns there. Um, my preference would be to allow something like a tightly regulated claim, something as simple as harmful but less harmful than smoking. Um, so I believe that the message is a fundamentally important one. It's not an endorsement of use, it's an acknowledgement of fact. And as I said, it's taken us a little ways to get here, but I think it's time that we need to acknowledge the facts in terms of, of the potential risks. Um, but I wouldn't give the sort of industry a sort of a blank check to go and sort of frame that health communication. I would prefer to have it tightly regulated. Thank you. Senator Eagleton to be followed by Senator Stuart Olson. Well, thank you very much for both of you being here. You're, you're excellent witnesses and I think uh, are helping us a great deal. Uh, I, I buy the argument that the vaporized product is, is less harmful, even though we don't know the, the, the long-term effects and it will take some time. I think both of you have said that. But I'll come back to the flavors because I think here uh, what we're trying to do is prevent kids from getting into this kind of product as much as tobacco, uh, we don't want them into that either. Uh, but we don't want them in this, and and we and and the feeling is that having flavors that relate to things that they're attracted to, bubblegum flavors or whatever else, is um, is something that may entice them and act as a gateway. Um, so we want to prevent that on the one hand, but on the other hand, we're recognizing that this can be valuable as to help c cessation. Of, of smoking. Now, the people I've talked with uh, who are in that latter category think that the uh, flavor of the product is an important aspect. So, where do we uh, where do we draw the line here? Where 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 do we reconcile this? Trying to keep it out of the hands of kids, but trying to make it still something that people that want to quit smoking will find appealing. And I'm told that that the taste is a factor in all that. So I'll start with Dr. Hammond on that and then Dr. Britton. Well, I'll start by agreeing with what you said anecdotally and what Dr. Britton said, which is the flavor is very important. Um, but you can allow flavor without allowing all flavors. And, uh, you know, there are, we know, so we've done research asking, you know, thou tens of thousands of youth, have you tried and what flavor? We've done experimental studies to test the appeal of different flavors. There are some flavors that preferentially target kids. Candy, many types of candy. There are other flavors that may appeal to both but aren't preferentially targeting kids, for example, fruit flavors. So um, I wouldn't suggest a ban on flavors. I would simply suggest the ban on flavors that preferentially target kids. And I think there's a wide scope for having flavors, you know, mint and, and, and you know, fruit flavors and things like that, that we know many smokers use. In fact, those are some of the most flavors out there to begin with. So I wouldn't suggest banning those, but um, I don't think you, you need flavors that preferentially target kids or my favorite flavor I've seen is unicorn horn flavor. Um, you know, I, I, I think we need some bounds in terms of um, keeping these to a, to a reasonable scope. Dr. Britton. Uh, I agree. i perhaps a little bit more liberal on flavors. I, the data from the ASH survey that I mentioned uh, earlier in my uh, testimony found that in the UK, uh, the 42% of electronic cigarette users use fruit flavored products. 23% choose tobacco, 13% menthol. So fruit flavors with adults are very important. We, we run a, a panel, a smokers group in Nottingham to, to try research ideas out on them and to get their feedback on, on what we're doing. And we had a session once on flavors and how important they were. There are a number of vapors in that group and they said, take the flavors away, and it will be very difficult for me to continue vaping. So I think the, the key is to allow the flavors to be there. And I may have misunderstood the bill, but I thought that what you were trying to achieve was to stop those flavors being promoted in a way that would appeal to children. But I don't see why you can't have an electronic cigarette vapor on a shelf in a plain bottle that says cherry flavor. And that would allow the smoker to use it. Where flavors are a problem are that most of the flavors used in electronic cigarette fluid 
are food flavors, which were never designed to be heated. And when you do heat them, you get much of the toxin that appears in, in different electronic cigarette vapors comes from the flavors. So my advice to the smokers that I treat is very much, if you can, use an unflavored solution. If you have to use a flavor, use menthol, because that's something that that's probably better in those circumstances, but it's better to avoid the fruit flavors. But the fact remains that many smokers want them. So I think it will be a mistake to, to withdraw that option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Stuart Olson to be followed by Senator Petticaire. Yep. Uh, thank you, um, gentlemen, both of you for being with us. Um, Dr. Britton, does in the UK do they have the government actually said this uh, is a benefit to helping you this uh, stop smoking? Has the government actually come out and made that statement? The, well, I'm trying to think of an explicit statement. Use electronic cigarettes. Our government has come out several times in saying that harm reduction is an important complement to establish tobacco control in different ways. And it's to the last two tobacco control policies in our cancer reform strategy. Um, our uh, Public Health England, which now leads on public health in the English National Health Service, has come out very strongly in saying that electronic cigarettes are a good thing for British English public health. That's the jurisdiction is England and have built, uh, published a document a year or so ago listing the medical organizations that support that position, and it is the great majority. So we are in a situation where we, as Dr. Hammond has said, we have a growing consensus that these products are helpful. They are being adopted into our uh, NHS-run Stop Smoking Services. Uh, the Teaching and leadership organization for those is something called the National Center for Smoking Cessation Training. They put out a briefing about a year ago explaining how to integrate electronic cigarette use when treating smokers and offering them evidence-based cessation care. So we're pretty much there. There are some dissenting yeah. voices in the UK as elsewhere in the world, but we're pretty much there. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does, and uh, I, I still am skeptical about the, them actually, politicians actually saying this is uh, helpful. So, thank you. Dr. Hammond. It is, what will be very helpful, I mean, I'm a researcher, we always think there should be more research, but we do need more evidence to understand, for example, are e-cigarettes equally effective as other forms of nicotine replacement therapy? Are they more? Are they slightly less? We know that they're certainly more appealing to use. Um, so, but I would go back to what Dr. Britton said, which is I think it's important to separate the two points. One is with respect to their relative harm, and the other one is with respect to the efficacy as a cessation device. And I think we have, um, you know, I suspect that both of those will, will come to, to be, but I think we have a lot more reason to believe certainly in the difference of relative harm uh, at this point. I'd like to make one very small point about dual use. I mean, I always say, I personally believe that vaporized products will have a public health benefit. Um, but again, it depends how they're used. And one of the, the dominant form of use in Canada is dual use, where you smoke and use a vaporized product. And the best science we have to date suggests that there may not be any health benefit from doing that, that you have to get off the smoke. Now, some people may be using it to cut back and plan to quit over the long term, and that will be a positive outcome. Um, but we need to make sure that these products are framed as a way to get people off smoking and not just as a complement to smoking. And that's where I would return to some of the messages around advertising. So I'm sorry if that was a bit broader than your question, but it relates to the idea of positioning these as cessation products. Dr. Britton, you wanted to come back in on this. Yeah, it was on, on the, the dual use issue and a point which I think hasn't yet been made. So Dr. Hammond is talking about the, our lack of understanding of where these products sit relative to established licensed nicotine replacement therapies. Um, there are two or three points relevant to this. The first is that in the UK, the MHRA, in its attempt to liberalise nicotine regulation or make it simpler, 
declared that any product that delivers nicotine is an effective smoking cessation aid. And the efficacy there depends on how quickly and how much nicotine it can deliver. So if an electronic cigarette delivers nicotine, it works as a cessation aid. But what's very important and where the strength of electronic cigarettes and other products that may come along like them lies is in that they are a social consumer alternative to smoking, not a therapy, first and foremost. So the therapeutic decision is made by the smoker who walks into a newsagent or a tobacconist or whatever the, the term would be in Canada and thinks, well, instead of buying a packet of cigarettes today, I will buy an electronic cigarette. There's no commitment to quit. It's just experimentation. And it is inevitable that there will be substantial dual use of those products. But our, the UK approach, which is embodied in, in guidance by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, is that encouraging smokers to take up an alternative source of nicotine and use it as a dual user will generate quit attempts. And that's simply because a smoker who thinks I cannot get through the day without a cigarette, who tries an alternative product and finds that actually they can get through, say, till lunchtime without a cigarette, will think, well, if I can do four hours, I can do eight, and if I can do eight, I can do a day, and so on. And the evidence is good that smokers who start using an alternative nicotine product alongside smoking are much more likely, twice as likely, to progress to quit than those who do not. I entirely agree with Dr. Hammond that in, while they're dual using, the benefit to health is negligible. But those that then make the step completely to an alternative source will get huge benefit. But the key thing is that consumer product positioning, not a medicinal product. We shouldn't think of these as cessation aids. We should think of them as tobacco substitutes. Thank you. Senator Petitclerc to be followed by Senator Seidman. Merci beaucoup. Uh, my, my question Thank you. to Dr. Britton, uh, as you know, this bill is really trying to achieve this balance in, in protecting our youth um, and giving access to smokers who, who, who want to stop. So I, I want to hear you about, um, in, in your experience, in the UK experience, if you saw a bit of a side effect uh, in terms of the market, you know, once you have the vaping products and the advertising and uh, maybe the promotion or information of it, um, do you feel that the UK was able to contain uh, vaping products to um, to smokers wanting to quit or, or did it attract a, a whole new market of non-smokers starting to vape is... Uh, uh, what I'm trying, because I know we're, we're talking about the gateway situation with the kids, but uh, maybe on a broader term uh, for kids for sure, but also for non-smokers, adults, and, and if you want to, uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the short answer is that in the UK, electronic cigarettes are being used almost exclusively by smokers. So the concern that you express is one that we all share. Mm -hmm. uh, that children become addicted to these products and move on to become smokers. And for the four years or so that we have decent data in the UK, that just hasn't happened. Use of nicotine by non-smoking children is negligible. And if you think about it, that makes sense because unlike most other drugs that have a street trade or an illegal trade, nicotine doesn't make you feel good. So early experiences with nicotine, as anybody sitting around your table now will recall, are actually quite aversive. So there is a lot of child experimentation with electronic cigarettes in the UK because adolescent kids try things. But for the great majority of those, it's a trial and then thinking, what's the point, and move on to the next thing. So use by never smokers is negligible. So thus far, at least, we have no grounds to be concerned that there will be a big gateway effect. Dr. Hammond? Yeah, and I can certainly speak to the Canadian market. Uh, you know, we have had a very large number of Canadian youth, including non-smokers, try e-cigarettes. Um, but it is also true that very, very few of those go on to use them regularly. So most of them uh, just try it, and it looks like they try it once or twice, and that's it. So I would say, like the UK, we have um, 
I think it's fair to say negligible levels of regular use among non-smoking youth, and that's very important. Um, I think for all the reasons Dr. Britton said, but I would, I would state that that's not a fixed quotient. So one of the things that a lot of people talk about is the evolution of these devices and their ability to deliver nicotine. Um, and for a smoker, you want it to compete with cigarettes in terms of nicotine delivery. Um, and there's a lot of talk about promise of better nicotine delivery over the coming years. Um, and so that conversion factor, which is very low right now from trial to regular use, that may not be a fixed quotient. Now, I don't say that in an alarmist way. Um, I've, I've stated that I believe that we should make these products more available to smokers. But I would just note that it's not a given. Um, and that along with the product itself and the drug itself, that's where marketing and promotion is, are very important in terms of shaping who uses the product. So, um, you know, the bill is trying to achieve that balance um, and, and I think it's, it's important that it seeks to do so. Thank you. Senator Seidman, followed by Senator Eggleton. Thank you, thank you. And both of you are providing us with enormously important testimony and I, I thank you both very much for that. Um, I did want to ask you about the gateway effect and whether um, cigarettes, uh, e-cigarettes specifically, would tend to renormalize smoking after, you know, long public health campaign, anti-smoking campaigns over decades. Um, and you've partially addressed that issue, um, but there isn't a whole lot of scientific evidence to date uh, on this matter. Um, and I'm wondering if you can help me understand, um, you know, if, if I look at, for example, one in four Canadian youth aged 15 to 19 reported ever having tried an e-cigarette, um, and one in three young adults 20 to 24, uh, this is the, you know, up-to-date 2015 uh, numbers. Um, so 18% of students in grades 6 to 12 have ever used an e-cigarette. Okay, so it's pretty low, um, but what do you think and what kind of science do we need um, to determine that in fact that we won't, we're not en route to renormalization of smoking for a whole new generation? Dr. Hammond. Uh, Dr. Hammond, perhaps you could start. We don't know and we can't know ahead of time. I, what we do know is the ways in which advertising and marketing shapes social norms and how it's done that for tobacco. And we've got the first half of the last century in terms of promoting its uptake and then we have the second half of the century trying to unravel that. And we see it in the conclusion with something like plain and standardized packaging. Um, so we know it can be done um, and I think you know I consider myself to be quite a centrist on this type of issue. but. Um, when you think about allowing advertisements on TV and radio, uh, and when you consider, even if you try and prevent cross-branding, I mean, it is extremely difficult, as I said, to determine what is adult-oriented and what is youth-oriented. And by the time we figure it out and we act, it's five or ten years later. And so I come back to, will the advertising and marketing promote use that benefits public health, or will it promote the other side of use, which, although it's negligible now, may or may not undermine it. And even if it doesn't make kids want to try vaporized nicotine products, it could renormalize smoking. So I am not an alarmist on this issue, but it is alarming to think about the extent of marketing for nicotine products, particularly for companies that also have a main primary interest in selling tobacco products. And what is proposed in the bill is beyond what I understand will be allowed in New Zealand, for example, or what is currently allowed in UK, where they don't allow TV and radio advertising um, based on a European directive. So I'm not sure I have a satisfactory answer to your question, but I think even though we haven't seen it to date, it remains a possibility, and advertising and marketing, above all, I think will be the determinant of that. Because you're making an important point. And so are you suggesting that uh, this bill ought to be more restrictive as far as advertising is concerned to youth? I am. I think you can think about, oh, I think about advertising two ways. One in terms of its content, so that would be whether it's appealing to youth or not, and the second one is where it's allowed in, in channels. Um, and I think 
again, I do not believe that adding, allowing lifestyle advertising will make a smoker any more likely to switch. They have every incentive to do so, and I think there are other very important ways of incentivizing that through price, differential health warnings, and things like that. Um, so I don't, I personally, I don't see the value of lifestyle advertising. Secondly, I'm concerned about advertising in channels, even it's, if it's meant to be non-lifestyle advertising that will be viewed by our children, and that would be TV, radio, and some of those other mainstream channels. And did you say there was a particular country that we ought to have a look at as well, a model? I was just pointing out that my understanding is that there's New Zealand has proposed new regulations as of last week, and my understanding is that they have not allowed adult-oriented advertising in TV and radio. My understanding is that that's no longer allowed in the UK. Um, so those could be possible models, but I don't pretend to know those regulations terribly well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Uh, I'm going to follow up here. Um, Dr. Hammond, uh, related to this, you made a comment earlier uh, with regard to the uh, possible conversion of vapor smokers, youth vapor smokers, uh, into uh, tobacco, one of the issues mm -hmm. around this. Could you, could you elaborate as to whether there is any evidence that you're aware of that a youth uh, taking up vaping uh, what percentage go on to uh, mm -hmm. smoke these smokers? We will actually have a study come out in a medical journal very soon that shows that we follow people up over time. And so we followed kids up, about 20,000 kids over 12 months. And everyone was a non-smoker at the start. And the kids among those who are non-smokers who tried a vaping product were much more likely to go on to become a smoker. But here's the thing with that. We call it the gateway effect. It's true for tobacco and alcohol and marijuana. And most of that is that the kids who are likely to smoke are also likely to try a vaping product. So th this is again in the fog of all these findings. So is there association? Yes. Is it causal? It's probably just the common factor of the kids who like to do those things do those things. It's like predicting one nicotine product with another. So, you know, and I would reiterate that it is very low, it is very uncommon for a non-smoker youth to use e-cigarettes regularly. So we have not seen it, and I would absolutely echo what Dr. Britton has said there. Um, but what I'm also saying is, is we don't entirely know what's going to happen as these products evolve. And if you have a wave of advertising and marketing for products like we haven't seen in several decades, I don't know that that will be the case. But I. I, I can't tell you that that wouldn't be a problem either. Okay. Uh, Dr. Britton, do you have anything to add to this particular discussion? Uh, well, in answer to the question of how we keep tabs on what is going on, I think it, it's the more crucial than ever to be monitoring smoking and nicotine use behaviors in young people and in adults. That's where the proof of the pudding lies. So we have the good fortune to have decent uh, surveys of young people in, in across the UK, and they all show the same thing as, as Dr. Hammond has said, which is negligible use by non-smokers. And I entirely echo the comments that children who are more likely to try vaping products are much more likely also to be trying cigarettes anyway. They come from families where people smoke, or maybe where those smokers have become vapors. They're exposed to the products, they're more likely to use them. But we just have to watch what is happening. I share concern about the ability of some of the commercial organizations involved in this market, even if not now, certainly in the future, to target children and target non-smokers with a lifestyle product. And that would be negative for public health. So there is a very strong case to restrict and control and monitor advertising. But the proof of the pudding is in who's using the product and how long for. And at the moment, the signs in the UK, for sure, are that both among children and among adults, use by never smokers is negligible. Thank you. Senator Hartling to be followed by Senator Eggleton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you've eight minutes. Um, I'm questioning, I guess, about the, we know a lot of us are really familiar with secondhand smoke and how that affects us and is harmful. So I'm wondering about the vaping or the e-cigarettes. Are there any, is there any research done on the effects of that? Uh, can it affect us and how could it affect us? Anything on that? Could you want to start, uh, Dr. Hammond? Sure. You know, I think you can sort of 
make some inferences from what we believe to be the case with the direct health effects, which is there's just a lower level of chemicals, there's fewer chemicals in the air, and so uh, it, it may present a public health risk, but it won't be the same as smoking. And I think um, my understanding of the regulations in Canada, which as I understand are mainly provincial, is that it prohibits vaping in public spaces yes. where smoking is prohibited, and I would suggest that that is a reasonable uh, preventive measure, um, which isn't to equate the two risks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you wish to comment on this? Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I, I agree that on the on the levels of risk, and we've discussed this already. On use in public places, I think it's a serious error to categorise electronic cigarettes with tobacco cigarettes in that context. Um, the evidence for harm from vapour to others is tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. In my view, not using an electronic cigarette in an enclosed, particularly one that produces clouds of vapour, is a courtesy issue. It's just not a pleasant thing to do. But equally, I would recall sitting on a train to a Stockholm station once and realising well into the journey that the man sitting opposite me had been using an electronic cigarette all the way through that journey. He wasn't exhaling clouds of vapour, and I could no more object to that than if he'd taken out a, a salbutamol inhaler to relieve his asthma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a further issue of, for example, in Britain anyway, we have a very high prevalence of smoking in mental health populations. We have a big problem with smoking in hospitals providing secondary care. Now, electronic cigarettes can be part of the solution to that. When you come in and use our services, we ask you not to smoke. We will offer you the best help we can to help you quit smoking. But if you don't want that or can't do that, please, while you're here, don't smoke tobacco. But if you want to use an electronic cigarette, go ahead. Okay. So I think it's better if we, if we categorize e-cigarettes with tobacco cigarettes in the, where they can be used, the message again comes to the public that these are the same in terms of risk, and they're not. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Britton, uh, in, the, in the last, uh, we've, got a, we've got an echo here, okay. Dr. Britton, in the last exchange, uh, Dr. Hammond uh, suggested that uh, perhaps the UK has very recently uh, tightened its restrictions around uh, vaping products, uh, if I understood him correctly. Uh, could you comment on that? On advertising, in, in terms of yeah. advertising, yes. We, we, we have a, a, a voluntary code of practice through the Advertising Standards Authority. There's one for print media and there's one for broadcast media. And they are not allowed to promote electronic cigarettes to young people at all. Um, some limited advertising is, a, is accepted, but it's not allowed to associate the vaping product, say, with a tobacco product. Um, so there is a voluntary code that is followed, but we see very little advertising. Uh, well, I, I see very little advertising, but that may reflect my low consumption of some of these media. Rather. Right. <laughs> uh, we have a, a voluntary uh, agreements in our advertising industry, but uh, it's restricted to those who are members of uh, the uh, association. Dr. Hammond? My understanding is that uh, in 2016, at, through a European directive, it banned tobacco advertising and radio, so that's not voluntary. It gives countries the option to do things like billboard advertising. Scotland has decided not to do that. My understanding is that England right now is still permitting them. So my understanding is that because of a European directive, that uh, TV and radio uh, advertisements are no longer allowed. Dr. Britton? That, that, that comes in, that's in the process of coming into force. The new tobacco control directive becomes law on the 20th of May. Okay, so what Dr. Hammond so summarized is in the process of becoming uh, uh, effective. Uh, uh, yes, our advertising, sorry, so went from, a, from free advertising uh, through uh, the uh, Advertising Standards Authority uh, controls, which yes, they are voluntary controls, but um, they are reasonably well adhered to, and certainly the complaint through a complaint process, adverts that are deemed to have broken the code are, are then removed. Um, but yes, things are getting much tighter in May. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Eagleton, and depending on the length, possibly one more question, but. Okay, I, wa I want to drill down a little bit more on this uh, uh, marketing advertising situation, because we, we've got to figure out where to draw the line here. We, we obviously don't want to promote to, to youth, uh, but on the other hand, we want to make people who are willing to use this product or could use this product aware of its uh, existence. Um, so it's easy to say, well, you can't um, advertise directly to, to youth. Well, but there is a crossover here where in trying to promote it as a less hazardous uh, form of, uh, of smoking and a way of moving towards cessation, um, you know, there's got to be some means of doing that. And there could be a crossover that can create a problem. So where, where do you draw the line here? What, what, do you, what forms of, of uh, marketing or advertising or promotion for a, as a cessation product uh, would we uh, allow to be carried out for vaporized uh, uh, cigarette, e-cigarettes uh, that don't cross over that line? Dr. Hammond? Well, I was hoping nobody would ask me to be specific. Um, <laughs> look. Half of all of our smokers in Canada have used a vaporized product already. It's about 80% when you look at younger smokers. So I don't think it's a case of sort of making people aware of e-cigarettes. Um, you know, I think I also stated earlier that I think it is important to provide market advantages to the less harmful products. So vaporized products should be allowed to be promoted more than smoked products. Your question was, okay, what exactly does that look like? Um, I think you can have, I mean, I keep saying tax price because that is a very important determinant. So I, I think you can have differential taxation price levels. I think you can have different types of health warnings. So if, if cigarettes are ultimately sold in plain standardized cigarette packaging, you could allow brand imagery on, on vaporized products. You could allow product displays in retail outlets, which are currently prohibited for uh, smoked products. You could allow more price promotions. Um, and perhaps you could allow some non-lifestyle advertising in adult-oriented settings, so bars, direct mail. Um, so I don't pretend to have the exact answer on where you should draw the line, and, and there is no objective answer to your question, I don't think. Uh, and, you know, it's possible that Dr. Britton or others would draw that line somewhat more liberally, but I suppose I'm guided by uh, being a bit more cautious about allowing advertising. It's much, much easier to permit more advertising in the future than it is to scale it back. You know, it's a lot harder to put the genie back in the bottle, so perhaps I'm being a bit more conservative, but I think you can still incentivize vaporized use over smoked without uh, necessarily going to the full lengths that are in the bill at the moment. Dr. Britton, do you have a quick comment? Uh, broadly, I would agree with that position. The only thing is that um, many smokers have yet to try electronic cigarettes, and even, well, in, in the UK still, we have a substantial proportion of smokers who believe that nicotine is hazardous and that they shouldn't use these products for that reason. So I think there's a very strong case for health promotion messages to establish smokers. But this also comes back to the denormalization or renormalization arguments. What's happening in Canada and in Britain is that smoking rates are falling very quickly. And in Britain, since electronic cigarettes came, became widely used, we've seen prevalence fall by 0.9 of a percentage point each year for the last three years. In the absence of any new significant policy, our standardized packaging comes in next month. So that is a huge fall for free, really, just from a consumer solution to the problem. We are seeing smoking becoming denormalized. And if the other side of that coin is that electronic cigarette use becomes normalized, I wouldn't have a problem with that. The benefits to society long term, if all of our smokers switch directly to electronic cigarettes as a result of advertising and even uh, let's say it, some people become nicotine users as a consequence of that process, will still be less than the status quo, which is to have a fifth or a sixth of our adults killing themselves with tobacco. 
Thank you very much. Well, I want to uh, thank you both uh, for <clears throat> your exceptionally clear uh, testimony, detailed uh, responses to the questions that have been asked. You've been enormously helpful to us. Uh, Dr. Britton, thank you so much for uh, joining us across the airwaves, and Dr. Hammond for coming in to uh, join us here today. To my colleagues once again for the nature of your questions. And with that, I'm suspending the meeting for very briefly for a quick turnaround to our next panel.